Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bestrom, the Director of Public Programs, and I'm very pleased to welcome you all to today's Hammer Forum on the rise of nonprofit journalism. The Hammer Forum is a monthly series of public discussions about current social and political issues. And tonight, we welcome Megan, Megan Garvey from Southern California P Public Radio, Nico Mealy from the Harvard from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, Emily Ramshaw from the Texas Tribune, and our moderator, Pod Save America's Shaniqua McClendon. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please silence your cell phones, and please note that videography and photos are not allowed in the theater, but we are videotaping this program, and we'll put it up on our website, and you can share it with your friends and family anytime. I also want to mention a few upcoming Hammer programs you might be interested in. Next Wednesday, June 5th, we are... Um, having a sneak preview of a major new work that the renowned theater director Peter Sellers is developing. Um, and then on June 6th, artist Arthur Jaffa, who just got the Golden Lion Award at the Venice Biennale, he's gonna be here in dialogue with slavery historian Sadia Hartman from Columbia University. And on Saturday, June 8th, you're all invited to a big opening party celebrating our summer exhibitions, and that's from 8 to 10 p.m. Saturday night. So. On to tonight's program. I'm going to quickly introduce our, our speakers and then we'll get started. Megan Garvey is the managing editor of Southern California Public Radio, or SCPR, which is a member supported public media network that operates public radio stations from Santa Barbara to LA and Orange Counties and the Coachella Valley. And they also operate news and culture websites, mobile and social media channels, and live events. Here in Los Angeles, SCPR is pretty much synonymous with KPCC Public Radio at 89.3 FM. As managing editor, Garvey oversees SCPR's reporters, editors, and producers. She also edited the podcast, The Big One, Your Survival Guide, which covers what it'll be like in the aftermath of a major earthquake in LA. It's a great podcast. Uh, Garvey, uh, Garvey came to SCPR after almost 20 years at the LA Times, where she started as a reporter in the San Fernando Valley and departed as the deputy managing editor overseeing digital news and innovation. She also shared in winning two Pulitzer Prizes as one of the lead writers for the coverage of the 2004 California wildfires and as editor of the live coverage of the 2015 terrorist attack in San Bernardino. Before joining the Times, Garvey worked as a reporter for the North Carolina News and Observer and as a news aide at the Washington Post. Nico Mealy is on the faculty at the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. From 2016 to 2019, he was the director of the center where he started new programs focused on sustainable models for local journalism, as well as programs on understanding misinformation on social networks and algorithms for filtering hate speech online, and accountability of online platforms like Facebook and Twitter. He teaches classes on technology's impact on media, politics, and public policy. And his prior experience includes a stint at the LA Times, as well as founding technology companies and working on political campaigns. He has published widely, including the international best-selling book, The End of Big, How the Digital Revolution Makes David the New Goliath. Emily Ramshaw is the editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune in Austin, Texas. The Tribune was formed in 2009 with the aim of promoting civic engagement through original journalism and public events. They are a nonprofit, nonpartisan digital news organization that produces politics and policy news, statewide live events, and they operate the largest statehouse reporting bureau in the nation. Under Ramshaw's leadership, the Tribune has won a Peabody Award, several National Murrow Awards, and top honors from the Online News Association. They utilize a free syndication model, and as a result, their journalism fills the pages of Texas newspapers and TV broadcasts statewide, and provide Texas-specific reporting for both the Washington Post and the New York Times. Before joining the Tribune as one of its founding reporters, Ramshaw spent six years at the Dallas Morning News, during which she was named the 2008 Star Reporter of the Year by the Texas Associated Press Managing Editors. In 2016, she was named to the board of the Pulitzer Prize. Our moderator tonight is Shaniqua McClendon. She is the political director for Crooked Media, home to the popular podcast, Pod Save America. At Crooked Media, at Crooked Media she led the creation of their midterm voter engagement program called Vote Save America. She's a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government where she earned, earned her master's in public policy. 
During her studies, she also worked at Facebook on their politics and government out outreach team. Prior to graduate school, McClendon served in various capacities on Capitol Hill, starting off as an intern in the Obama administration. And then she was a staff assistant for Senator Kay Hagan and went on to serve as legislative director for Congresswoman Alma S. Adams. So now please join me in welcoming Megan Garvey, Nico Mele, Emily Ramshaw, and our moderator, Shanequa McClendon. Good afternoon. Oh, good evening, everyone. It's still daylight outside, so it made me think it was um, the afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to have this conversation about nonprofit journalism. Um, my undergrad degree is actually in journalism, but I haven't really used it a ton, but I'm still like very interested in the field. And while I was at the Kennedy School, um, did a lot of stuff with the Shorenstein Center. <coughs> Um, and so we're here to talk about the rise of nonprofit journalism. And as it's been, I guess it's weird to say nonprofit journalism has been in the press, um, but as more attention is paid to it, um, you know, I think some people might think it's more of a, a new phenomenon, but nonprofit journalism has been a part of the journalism industry for some time. As I was researching for this panel, I found out and was interested to find out that um, in 1846, Five New York City newspapers funded a Pony Express route through Alabama to bring news of the Mexican War north faster than uh, the U.S. Postal Service was able to, um, and eventually that became the Associated Press. So we've had like a really long-standing um, nonprofit journalism, um, but nonetheless, over the past two decades, uh, the field has grown tremendously, and we'll get into why as we go through the panel. Um, but also as more people are getting their news online and ad revenue is diminishing and we've seen a lot of um, newsrooms close because of that, uh, nonprofit journalism has had even more space to grow and more organizations are um, popping up. And I just wanted to highlight some of the really good work last year, just two quick things, um, but there's a long list. There's, if you, there's a good BuzzFeed article that kind of lists out about 30 stories that were... Um, brought to the mainstream through nonprofit journalism. Um, but last year, ProPublica obtaining a recording of um, some children, or one child in particular, but from the detention centers that once they got that out, um, forced the Trump administration to reverse their child separation policy. As we know, there's still a ton of children who have not been reunited with their families, but that could have been even worse had that story not gotten out. And the new food economy reporting that Amazon was the highest employer of food stamp recipients, um, which probably wouldn't, it shouldn't be the case um, and doesn't make sense. But after getting that out there, Amazon raised their uh, minimum wage to $15 an hour for their employees. So, you know, nonprofit journalism is able to go in and in a lot of instances drive the national conversations around what we're talking about. And in my opinion, you know, sometimes refocus us away from Donald Trump always being the focus of everything. Um, so today, as we get into the conversation, we're gonna explore the rise of nonprofit journalism <coughs> against the backdrop of larger industry changes um, and, and talk about some of the business structures and just how the whole industry uh, fits into the larger journalism industry. But before we get started, if we could just give our panelists one more round of applause. So I gave a very, very brief, high-level um, description of uh, nonprofit journalism. But if you want to kick us off, if you could just go into a little bit more depth about what is nonprofit journalism, what are some of the trends that have allowed it to expand in, in recent years? Um, and then if um, Megan and Emily could just go into your specific organizations and talk about how you fit into, one, the nonprofit journalism space, but the larger journalism industry. Sure, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here, folks. The weather here is a little different from the weather in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, where it snowed two weeks ago. But uh, I really want to um, start by describing the, the overall landscape of journalism uh, in America today, because I don't think people understand the dramatic crisis journalism is in right now. 
In uh, 1980, there were the same number of steel workers as journalists in the United States of America. And today, there are fewer journalists than steel workers. And we have a whole lexicon and a cultural way of talking about the rust belt and the abandoned steel mills and the kind of, you know, the, the havoc that has wreaked on middle America. But actually, the collapse of journalism has been far more aggressive and much faster. It's happened all essentially since 2000. And um, it has affected all of our communities. Uh, there's a number of studies out. One, the big one, is out of UNC, Chapel Hill, usnewsdeserts.org. Um, and effectively, if you live outside the five largest cities in America, you probably have no local news. There are uh, 21 U.S. states that 10 years ago sent correspondence from local publications to Washington, D.C. that no longer do. That's 42 U.S. senators who will not get any questions from hometown publications during their seven years in Washington, D.C. And that's also 21 U.S. states where there was no reporting about how the tax bill or the infrastructure bill or the health care bill affects our community, our hospital, our, uh, our economies. And so this, this hollowing out of news in the United States, this dramatic, terrifying obliteration of a, of a crucial part of our democracy has had all kinds of unanticipated spillover effects and consequences, and it's quite severe. And it is in t almost all of that collapse is from a decline in advertising. Uh, for about 150 years, almost all the news in America was, was funded effectively by advertising, and um, uh, that, that's Advertising has collapsed. Advertising, you know, Wanamaker, the famous uh, uh, department store magnet in, in the 20s and 30s said, half of my advertising works, I just don't know which half. Well, it, it turns out that actually it's more like 0.001%, maybe even 001% of your advertising works. And you can actually just buy that thanks to technology. And that means that uh, at my former employer, the LA Times, Today is a Thursday, a full page, or t Tuesday. Today is a Tuesday, so a, a full page color advertisement on the back of the LA Times on a Tuesday in the print edition is about $40,000 to reach about 350,000 readers. To reach the exact same 350,000 readers with an ad buy on the LA Times.com is about $5,000, and to reach the exact same uh, 350,000 readers of the Google search ad buy is about $16. And so that's just the fundamental economics that's hollowed out news in the United States. And it's into that void that uh, nonprofit news is, is seeing an opportunity. I think it's great we have Megan here from arguably the most important and longest running nonprofit news entity in the United States, which is our public media, public radio and Emily from uh, what is considered, I think, the rising star of n digital news startups in the nonprofit space. But to give, just a, to, to give just a little bit more perspective, we published a study, a study about a year ago where we looked at uh, 6,500 foundations and every grant they made to journalism over five years. Um, does anyone want to guess, on average, how much money goes from foundations to journalism on an annual basis? $350 million. Compare that, however, to the $60 billion in local news uh, in to the year 2000. And so in the year 2000, there's about $60 billion in local news. To last year, I think it, it's going to end up somewhere around $12 billion. Uh, and the, the $350 million in nonprofit news is still just really a drop in the bucket. It's also worth noting that of that $350 million, about 44% goes to PBS and NPR. Um, only about 5% goes to local news. And so I think that as this, we have this giant collapse of, of new local news in the United States in the commercial sector, the only real path forward, in my opinion, is nonprofit news. It's through traditional organizations like your local public radio station. It's also through startups like the Texas Tribune. But regardless, we need an order of magnitude larger investment in nonprofit news in the United States.
I, I'm trying to remember if Nico was this depressing when I worked with him. <laughs> I, think, I think some of the time. Um, some of the time you definitely were this depressing, so. We're, we're, you can see we're both no longer there, so. Um, you know, I was telling them earlier, I was at this uh, week-long workshop at Pointer, which is down in St. Petersburg last week, and they do a lot of work to sort of bolster and give newsrooms new skills, right, to try to make it in this environment that, that Nico has just described pretty accurately. And it was funny because there were six public radio newsrooms represented, and then the rest, another 10 from commercial print newspapers, largely in smaller communities. I think maybe the biggest one was Buffalo, New York. And um, while they were all going, you know, presenter after presenter going up and talking about all the layoffs they'd had since August when we last saw them, like the public radio people are like, oh my God, this is, I mean, I'm, I need a drink. This is like really, you know, really uh, distressing. And, and it is really distressing, but I want to tell a little bit different story, um, which is, you know, I'm at, KPCC, which I hope a lot of you guys listen to and members, thank you, thank you. And we, we acquired um, last year LAist, LAIST.com, which was an, a local um, uh, website, right, that covered culture and food and, and increasingly news that got shut down by the guy who owns the Cubs because they tried to unionize and he didn't like that, so. Um, but KPCC was in the basement of Pasadena City College for many years. They did things like they had polka, and they did have Larry Mantle even back then. And they didn't have news. And it wasn't until um, you know the late 90s that the idea of actually going for a, an all-news format public radio station here even happened. And so it's really with the support of probably many of you in this room that we now have the second biggest newsroom in Southern California. We have about close to 90 people in our newsroom. We have additional people on the business side. And we're really providing you know, vibrant local news. And the goal I've given my reporters is really not to be an echo chamber, to really find stories that you wouldn't otherwise find. So I think with the support of the public, you can build a robust newsroom that is sustainable going forward. So as depressing as that was, I do think there's reason to hope. And it is, it is by getting people to participate in democracy mm -hmm. and, and recognize the importance of journalism as a cornerstone of democracy that, that that's how, where we are how we got to where we are today and hope to move forward. We're growing. All these commercial newsrooms are, are basically shrinking unless they're bolstered by billionaires. I'm also not going to be Debbie Downer here. I mean, we, you know, I spent the first four years of my career at the Dallas Morning News, a regional news organization that was hemorrhaging jobs and hemorrhaging money, hemorrhaging advertising revenue. Uh, I left to help start the Tribune, Texas Tribune, 10 years ago. Almost it'll be 10 years in November. And when we started, we were doing something totally, it, it felt preposterous. A bunch of us left legacy media said there's got to be a new way to fund this where we aren't basically dependent on the whims of our shareholders and on you know shrinking advertising revenue. Uh, we decided we were going to be basically the newsroom that supported all of the other Texas newsrooms that were shrinking. The, you know, the first thing they all cut when they cut was their capital coverage. They had nobody storming the halls of their state legislatures or in Washington covering Congress. Um, so we started, there were seven of us, uh, a really diversified revenue model that included foundation support, philanthropy, membership, you know, the, the public radio viewers like you model, uh, pretty serious corporate underwriting, and an events business, which has been exceedingly robust, and we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, and, you know, 10 years in, that initial reporting staff of seven is uh, over 70 people. Um, we're a $10 million a year operation. We're sustainable. We're making money. We're growing. Uh, and we are for free powering the newspapers and radio stations and TV stations all across the state of Texas and, candidly, uh, the nation. So it's been really, um, uh, you know, a, a remarkable thing to watch this organization grow. There are now, since the Tribune started, 70-plus news organizations, nonprofits that have cropped up in our model. We now do a lot of consulting with these news organizations all across the nation. So there's a new model here that's working, uh, and you know we just deeply believe that journalism is a public service, and we've convinced our readers to support us in spades. Megan, um, could you also, just because public radio has been around for so long um, and existed as, as nonprofit journalism, could you talk about maybe the role um, that it's playing in the current expansion of nonprofit journalism? 
Yeah, I mean, I actually feel like it should play. It's I look at all these panels of these, you know, newsrooms that are trying to go to digital subscription models or trying to go to membership models, and they almost never have anyone from public radio on those panels. And I'm kind of like, I haven't even been in public radio that long, and I just wonder why not? Because I think you know there is a, a skill to getting to, to persuading people to donate, and a couple things. I mean, national public radio is not that much not that much older than I am. I mean, it was like an idea that came out in 1970 and then was on the air in 1971. And I think the conceit of it um, that has proven to be very sustainable is that you know, you're know you not gonna be, you can turn on 89.3 on your radio, you can get our app for free if you're an app person, you can read las.com, you can go to our website, kpcc.org and stream. You're never gonna, no one's ever gonna stop you, you're never gonna get like you've reached your free, free article limit, right? So then that means that we have to do the kind of journalism and do the kind of programming that I can go on the air and you will hear me in a couple of weeks. Sorry, it's the spring member drive coming up. Um, and I have to persuade you that what we did was valuable and that you're part of our community and that you're sustaining journalism that matters. And I think that that created a really different model than the transactional model where you know I pay a quarter or a dollar or whatever for the copy of the paper, and that's the extent of the relationship. And you know, we have this open house every year, and it's amazing the people who come in. I would say, like, I worked for the LA Times a long time. When I told people I worked for the LA Times, they would be impressed, you know, some of the time, a little bit. But like, I tell people I work for KPCC, and the people who know and care about it, they're like, oh my God, I, can't, I love you, you know, I love Larry Mantle, I listen to you all day long. And I think that there's that real emotional connection that was made that I think that the commercial newsrooms didn't have to create. And I think that that's really kind of the secret sauce of public media and a little bit of guilt maybe. Uh, I think it's worth just pointing out that people think uh, public media is funded by the government and in fact it, it really almost is not. It's, it depend very station to station, but generally single digit percentage of funding is from the government. Yeah, we always say the largest and most important source of our donations come from members, right? We're yeah. member supported. It's entirely public news in the United public media news in the United States is entirely member supported. It's also worth noting that uh, the United States is the only uh, industrialized nation where that's the case. Uh, if you look at 17 industrialized nations from, of course, the UK, BBC to Japan, uh, the average per capita investment in public media is $84. In the United States, it's $3. Wow. Um, so something that was touched on by each of you is the different revenue streams and, and different business models that um, nonprofit journalism uses. Could you walk us through what your a little more detail about what your business model looks like, but also touch on your time um, in legacy media and what those differences look like? Uh, and then after that, um, if we could just get an idea of what financial decision making looks like when you're in for-profit media versus nonprofit media, um, and you know you have shareholders in for-profit media, but who are those people that you may be accountable to in the nonprofit space? I mean, I can start. I, I told you all a little bit about sort of what the breakdown of our funding looks like. Um, you know, we are not uh, beholden to shareholders, which is really amazing because all of our journalism, all of the money we make for our journalism can go back into our journalism, which is a pretty exceptional thing to get to do in this industry. But we are raising money from, you know, equal parts um, foundations that are supporting us through grants, uh, major philanthropists, people who give us anywhere from $1,000 to a $1 million a year. Uh, members, those are people you know who give us anywhere from $30 to $100 a year. Um, we have an events business where we put on 60 plus events around the state of Texas every year that are free to the public. We let the public basically interact with their policymakers. Um, we also put on a three-day politics and policy festival. It's like a Lollapalooza for Texas policy nerds. Uh, and we make $2 million in a single weekend. That's $2 million going straight to journalism over the course of three days. Um, and finally, corporate underwriting, which looks a lot to the untrained eye like advertising, uh, but it's major corporate sponsors who are basically saying, we want access to the eyeballs on your site. So for us, it's really diversified. We do really uh, interesting things like, um, I like to say that we are revenue promiscuous. Uh, we will <laughs> accept money from anyone. 
And uh, we brokered a big deal last year where all of the textbooks in Texas now license Texas Tribune stories. Um, when the uh, border crisis broke out this past year, I got pretty entrepreneurial. I called Time Magazine and said, yo, your coverage is not nearly as good as, it, good as it should be. I know you've got some new billionaire funder. Why don't you all pay us to provide your national border coverage? And they did, and we were able to keep seven reporters on the border for more than four months. Uh, they you know, paid us. We had a crowdfunding campaign that matched it. So there are national folks who have money, and we can get them to turn around and support local journalism. So we'll take money from anybody, and we work hard at it. I mean, members are, you know, a major source of our funding, and that's why some of the, like, headwinds in the industry are concerning to, to public media, public radio in particular. So, like, you can imagine if we got to the point where there really were self-driving cars, would people be, like, watching television in their cars? Would they still be tuning in to, broad, you know, to broadcast? So those are things, some of the things we think about when we think about how we distribute both how we're getting our revenue and how we, how we distribute our journalism. So members, um, uh, underwriting... Foundations are a big source of, of our contributions. Um, and more and more, we want to think about the event space and the on-demand space. So right now, um, we have about 60 free events a year. It's not, it has not traditionally been a source of revenue for us, or even really a particularly great source of, um, because of technical issues, like leads for people that you'd want to like bring into like our fold and then talk to consistently over time. You call it warming. You warm them up, right? Um, and then podcasts as well is something that I think, you know, you'll be hearing some interesting things about what's coming out of our, our operation on that front. And I think that's one of those, I, I'm a little, I have a little bit of fear that it's like the print pivot to video and that everyone does it because they think there's lots of money there and there, there isn't really a lot of money in podcasts yet. There's like really far out. Unless outliers. you're crooked media. Yeah, unless you're crooked, yeah, <laughs> unless you're podcast America. But I mean, even, you know, our big one, uh, the survival guide had well over a million downloads and, you know, I think we had some revenue, but I don't even know if it was revenue neutral. So, so those are the areas where we're looking. So we, I think that it's like the lesson from print, because if you ask me about what that model was, it was advertising. It was advertising. I mean, the subscriptions were nothing. It was, you, you, you gave it away almost because you, you had to have people pay to, to prove like your circulation and then your money was based on circulation and they made, they minted money. I mean, it was like, they made t high 20% profit. Mar I mean, like, what does a supermarket make? Well, like, uh, supermarkets don't really make very much money. I mean, one of the, one of the ways I describe it is that if you were one of my students at Harvard, and you wanted to graduate, and you were graduating in like 1980, and you wanted to make just an unfathomable amount of money, where would you go get a job? Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs, or a newspaper on the business side. Newspapers were so lunatically lucrative, it was one of the best business jobs you could get. And that has just not been true for 20 years now. And, uh, and that's, I think, affected talent in the industry. I did want to say one thing about both, both of your comments, uh, two things. First is that uh, I did want to point out member supported, but the news is still free. Right. That's a crucial difference. Uh, you know, the New York Times is reached the point where they have over two and a half million paying digital only subscribers that will almost cover the cost of all their newsroom activity. Uh, but in, in a world where increasingly, uh, with the collapse of advertising, the only real revenue model left for news is subscription revenue, you're, you're hitting paywalls daily more and more frequently. Um, I'm about to publish a paper. I got 500 publishers to give me five years of paywall data. And let me tell you, all the paywalls are tightening up. That's a world where news becomes a luxury good. That, that's a world where only people who will pay real money for news get news. And that's not very good for the democracy either. And in both the Texas Tribune and KPCC, you're looking at member-supported news, but the news remains free. It remains a public good, which is a really essential thing. I just want to follow up on that. Um, you know, if, if news starts to become a luxury good, that does that also determine whose stories are getting told and, and who has their concerns heard by, you know, the public, but especially, like, elected officials and the people who can change things. I, I mean, abs absolutely, and I think you even see that, you know, it's funny because you used to see all the repetition. I covered the 2000 political campaign. I spent, he asked me if I saw Vice because I spent most of the year with Dick Cheney, which was... Your, clo your close personal friend. 
sure he loved me a lot. Um, but, um, <laughs> no, he did not. Uh, but, you know, even then it was like, we were all kind of writing the same story. And now I look back on that, I'm thinking like, well, what were we doing? You know, I mean, it's like one narrow piece of the whole puzzle that was even getting covered then. And that was when, you know, in 2000, still pretty robust newsrooms. I mean, there'd been some, there's, there'd been some buffeting of the seas, but still pretty robust newsrooms. And we think a lot about that in, in our newsroom. And I think that that is like um, a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And one of the promises we're trying to make to our audience, our listeners and our readers, is that we will also listen to, to you right? Because I think, like, if you think about where news comes from, it's like, you know, frankly, it's, it's like press releases, it's, you know, city hall agendas, and that only covers, like, a thin slice of the world, and so I think, you know, having to create that relationship with our audience, I believe also will make our journalism better and reflect a lot more stories than you traditionally got. I would also say that our business model has allowed us to invest in diversity in a way that I think a lot of other newsrooms have not been able to have that luxury. You know, when you're, it's a, it's a hell of a lot easier to focus on diversity and diversifying your staff when you're growing than it is when you're contracting. Uh, and I think when you're not uh, worried about the same kind of profit margins and you don't have shareholders breathing down your neck, it, it's, a, it's really a luxury. Are there any kind of parameters that exist within nonprofit journalism um, that you feel have an impact on your editorial control or, you know, does your tax status affect that in any way? You know, when we started a nonprofit newsroom, people said to us, oh my God, how, there's no way you all are gonna be able to do this ethically. You know, you're gonna have donors mm -hmm. and sponsors and they're all gonna want something from you. And I was like, how the hell is that different from the news, the for-profit newsroom that I've worked in where, you know, advertisers were breathing down the publisher's neck about things. I mean, I actually remember more ethical quandaries in a for-profit newsroom than I ever have experienced in a nonprofit newsroom. You know, I, I think you have to have great ground rules in place. We have, uh, you know, our revenue team is extraordinary and they are make it abundantly clear to our sponsors that they don't get to put their thumb on the scale. You know, same with our donors, our foundations. Um, we're crazy transparent. I mean, we publish on our website literally every single dollar that anybody gives us and for what purpose. Uh, we put disclosures on the bottom of every single one of our stories saying, you know, this corporation was mentioned in this story. They've been a fiscal supporter of the Texas Tribune. So in my mind, it's all about being transparent. In a lot of ways, I think the nonprofits are even more transparent and have to be more transparent than the for-profits. I mean, I, I agree with Emily. Um, you know, you have, you have rules and practices in place to prevent that. And I think we make it very clear if someone's giving from a foundation or an individual donor that they're giving you know, either broadly to our, our overall fund to fund, you know, the, whatever journalism we determine is necessary and important, or sometimes specifically to broad thematic areas. So we do have some beats that I think we probably would not have if it wasn't for foundations or donors who had an interest, but we only do them if they make sense in sort of our broader mission. So I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, Prisca Neely covers early childhood development for us. It's a very unusual beat. It's funded by groups that care deeply about that issue. They have no influence on what she covers within that topic area. And I think it's a topic that actually has, has benefited us and, and, and told stories that you wouldn't otherwise hear. Same for arts education. Um, so I think it, I don't know that I would have given you know a blank slate, come up with those beats, but I think that they've been done in a way that really have informed the public. Prisca spent a lot of last year looking at a really um, difficult topic of black infant mortality, which is, it's much, black babies are much more likely to die in their first year of life than, than baby, white babies or babies of other races. And it's especially high in LA County. And I think it's such an important topic and she was able to give it really a lot of care, connect with it personally herself, about stories from her own family, in a way that I, it's hard for me to see that happening in a newsroom where you, we hadn't necessarily decided on caring specifically about that topic. So you could see it as limiting, but you could also see it as maybe broadening some of the traditional beats that get covered. Uh, so we've touched on a lot of the positives um, that, have, that exist in the nonprofit journalism world. How are you all thinking about sustainability, um, especially even thinking about the demographics of the country changing and appealing to them as that happens? Um, how, how does this stay successful? Uh, well, I think we already heard a little bit about what makes it successful. Emily used the word entrepreneurial. Uh, and even Megan talking about LAist and about expanding into podcasting 
the, the, the secret, I think, to the success and sustainability of nonprofit journalism, I would say, frankly, to journalism in the future, period, is, is news entrepreneurs, people like these two, in, uh, all three incredible women on stage who are uh, both deeply invested in journalism but also looking for every possible way to think about this differently. In some ways, we got so rigidly stuck in one way of thinking about how we fund news and what the purpose of news is that uh, it just requires new vistas of, of, of imagination and entrepreneurship. I, I, I actually think, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I used to play this game on my phone that was like a precursor to HQ called Crank. And I think Texas Tribune wrote the questions for Crank. We invented it. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> see? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that's part of why we did invest in, in Elias.com, because it is a younger demographic. But it also freed us up. It's funny, like, I like to say, because I believe this having um, you know, struggled to really pivot a, a big mainstream newsroom, as Nico knows. Um, you know, I think when you pair sort of tangible change with intellectual change, it's really valuable. So I think that like a place like Texas Tribune starting up, you can start fresh, right? And so at, uh, in my newsroom, by acquiring Elias, we were able to really think differently about how we were gonna do digital news and how we could be a lot more conversational and approachable. And I don't think anyone in the LA space really is saying, oh, we're gonna explain LA, we're gonna explain the news to you. We're, we're not gonna talk down to you. We're gonna accept that maybe you don't know everything. Maybe, maybe you're not following news 24 seven and maybe you need a couple things explained to you. And we're gonna do that in a way that's really accessible and not just for younger people, for everyone, right? You know, and I think that, that um, that's something that I think a lot of the mainstream newsrooms have really struggled with. There's this like traditional like arm's length way of writing. I did it myself for many years. That I, I think as we get more information about how people process information might not be that effective. And so I think really thinking about doing it entirely differently has been a challenge and interesting. And I think that we're better off for it. I think, you know, we used to print all this stuff and they tell you, oh, the pass through was three million readers. Like no one ever, no, three million people never read any one single item in any, in any news. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, maybe my stuff, but you know, I mean. But Surely I mean, I stuff. think, yeah, it was, it was, it was beautiful. Um, but I think, but I think that there was, there was that distance from reality that lets you think that everything you did was working. And I think like the, the experience that you have on whether people are giving because they're listening or whether people are giving online because they're reading or whether even people are reading and sharing are all, they, they seem like these scary metrics, but to me it's just information about whether what we're doing works. There's one other element of distance I want to talk about, and that's, you know, when I went to journalism school, uh, we were taught that the journalists operated in one sphere and the business staff operated in another sphere, and you better stay the hell away from those guys because it was unethical to, you know, be too close to them or know what they were doing. And as a result, I feel like we've raised this whole generation of journalists who not only don't understand the business model, but were trained to ask hard questions, yet weren't asking those hard questions of the people running revenue at their organizations. And my like mantra, or when I, you know, if I get to stand up in my uh, soapbox, we need to be training these young journalists to have this entrepreneurial spirit and really to understand that they need to be involved in figuring out where the money comes from in these organizations. The industry is changing so fast. Technology is changing so fast. You know, we really inspire our reporters to, you know what? You have a responsibility to engage with our members, to write the, you know, premium products that our news our newsletters that our members really engage with. You know, you have to be on stage at our events. You need to be on TV evangelizing for both the brand and our business model. It's not enough anymore to just be a journalist. You have to be an evangelist for the business model and for the future of the business. And so I think that was a really hard thing for a lot of people to get their head around because she's right. You'd come up and they'd say, oh, you don't have to worry about that. And there was a certain immaturity to it, right? Because as the industry is tanking, you have all these journalists who say, I don't have to change anything about how I'm operating. And that's not my problem. It's like, it kind of is your problem because um, you're going to get laid off. So, But um, I think that it's... Um, it's really interesting to think about, you know, whether your stories are being read and have an impact. And I think if you if you decide that that's crucial, right? If you're if you're doing something that would get people to pay for it, that that why is that a terrible thing to have to think about? 
Um, and I would say the story I heard that has stuck with me for a number of years now was when the Des Moines Register, which was you know, always a really renowned regional paper, when they were trying to make that pivot to be digital first, which really just means that you're not concentrated only on that print deadline. You're really trying to deliver news in a way that makes a lot more sense. Um, the, it was like a struggle, right? Because everyone's like, oh, I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about my metrics. I don't, you know, why do I have to? It's not my job to get someone to read this. And it's like, well, why isn't it your job? And one of the editors there finally said, how great a story was it if no one read it? And really, that's the bottom line, right? So you've got to find that audience. It's not, it's not everyone else's fault <laughs> that, that no one read your important story. So as we think about um, kind of nonprofit journalism's rise, if you will, um, what impact do you think it's had on journalism in general? And do you think it would be better if all journalism was nonprofit, or does for-profit journalism still have an important space in the industry? Nico has an opinion on this. <laughs> um, well, I think I, I struggle with it a bit. That in the United States, the only the only way we've had journalism is commercial journalism. That's it, and it's just abundantly clear that there is no future really for serious commercial journalism, especially at the local level. And so we must have we have to find a way to build nonprofit journalism in the United States, but and as exciting as, as the, this is, uh, we're still a long way from the scale of commercial journalism in the United States. And so that, that's, a, that's a dilemma and a struggle. But having looked at the business model infinitely, uh, I, I don't see any way we get there from here. There's not the, the economics of how it used to work just don't work anymore. And if we really believe that journalism is an important part of our communities, an important part of how we engage with each other with public policy, we must invest in nonprofit journalism. I want to offer two other uh, just footnotes to that. The first is that, you know, historically in America, nonprofit journalism was generally synonymous with uh, advocacy journalism, with very political points of view on the left and the right. And so one of the interesting things, because public media was considered kind of apart from nonprofit journalism, and nonprofit journalism meant the nation or the National Review, heavily partisan kind of ideological takes on, on current events. And what, what is exciting about what's happening in America is, I think, right now, a birth of this new model as, as kind of pioneered by the Texas Tribune um, around a more uh, 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 a, a nonprofit journalism that isn't ideological per se, is about holding power accountable. And that is the important bit, in my view, holding power accountable. Uh, and I, I would really love to hear from, from both of you about the challenges of investigative journalism. You know, one of my big concerns actually about the, this tenuous period when nonprofit journalism is growing. Uh, but is still kind of nascent, is that it's e it might be easy for powerful people to sue you out of existence. Mm -hmm. And this is not, a, this is not a, a joke. This is a serious problem. It happened to Gawker, which wasn't even a, which wasn't even a nonprofit. Um, Try operating in Texas, which is not a media-friendly environment. Yeah. <laughs> and just to put a, a cherry on top, because I'm such an optimist, uh, <laughs> You know, there's a, there's a new study out uh, that shows that within three years of a newspaper closing in a community, uh, the community pays as, pays as much as nine basis points on their municipal bonds. In other words, it gets a lot more expensive to borrow money to build your roads and pay for your schools if you don't have a newspaper, even when compared against comparable communities in the region economically, et cetera. Why? Well, we don't really know, but on the surface it looks like because corruption increases and it gets more expensive to borrow the money. And so I think there are really profound consequences, uh, and it boils down to, in my view, the importance of holding power accountable. Just speaking on that point quickly, investigative journalism is the most expensive journalism to produce. You know, it's why ProPublica has required such an enormous budget, and they, you know, that's all of their focus. The legal risk is real. And an organization like mine, even though we're sustainable and robust and we're growing, we can't take those kinds of risks. I mean, if we get sued you know, into oblivion, 
we aren't able to pay our reporters' salaries. So every time we're pursuing a big investigation, you know, we always get them lawyered, but we have to go extra, extra, extra steps. You know, we have to, and there have been cases where we've had to tone it back, where we've had to sort of shift the messaging a little bit because we really can't risk that. And, and we're sustainable. So imagine all these organizations that are just living on, you know, uh, duct tape and chewing gum right now. I mean, I think we benefit from being nested under something called American public media, um, which I think a lot of people knew originally as Minnesota Public Radio. You probably know Garrison Keillor, right? So, um, and, and so we have a larger corporate structure. We have, you know, a permanent attorneys. We have an attorney on, you know, retainer for our newsroom. And we have grown our investigative unit. It was sort of ad hoc before. Now we have three investigative reporters and a full-time editor. We have a data editor, and we have a really great consultant on our I-team. And I have to admit that I haven't really thought about it at that level, and maybe I'm just insulated. I mean, you always have to be careful, right? I mean, you, you always have to be really, really careful and um, bulletproof everything. But I do agree that it's like just such a critical critical part of what we do. And our, our I-team's um, mission statement, they, they, they're looking over the next you know, foreseeable future at um, how does who you are and where you live affect what kind of justice you get. And that's really like thematically what they're looking at, and everything from evictions to, to prosecutions. Um, so I think it's just, I think there's a way to do it, but you do have to find those investments, whether from you know, individual donors or foundations, and then how you use your general operating costs. But there, she's right, there is, there is a risk. Especially in Texas where the judges are elected. So if you don't end up with a jury trial, you're totally screwed. Well, we can and there I said I wasn't going to be Debbie Downer. <laughs> you I, roped me into it. I have one last question that can end on a, on a high note. Um, so, so if folks in here wanted to do something to support nonprofit journalism, what can they do? Um, and Emily, if you wanted to touch on the American Journalism Project. Well, I'll start with what you can do, which is texastribune.org slash donate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take any amount from any one of you. Um, I, I mean, I think, you know, you just mentioned something called the American Journalism Project. So the founder of, the original funder of the Texas Tribune, our founder, John Thornton, this was his brainchild. He happened, he's a venture capitalist and a media visionary, and we, I owe him my career. Uh, in the last uh, year or so, he is getting a new initiative off the ground called the American Journalism Project, where he's raising $40 million to basically start many Texas Tribunes all around the country. Uh, he has raised an exorbitant sum of money from Facebook, which is playing. Uh, I believe Google's involved. Um, the Knight Foundation, a big funder of media. So there are lots of folks getting off the ground in a lot of different communities. Um, I would say look for those different news outlets. Find ways to support them. Even if you can't make a contribution, become a member. Hang out on their, uh, you know, in their uh, events. Uh, be part of those communities. Even your eyeballs help us. I mean... <laughs> You, you can you, practice you know, your you pitch. Know, I, I just did that. The this member morning. drive's coming. <laughs> the member drive is coming. You know, you are our single and most important <laughs> source of funding. Um, you know, I think beyond being selfish and believing that what we're doing really matters and that you guys live here, um, I do think like finding whatever media source matters to you and resonates with you, and deciding if you are able to to make an investment. Um, in that, to whatever degree that you can support it. And I think it's really part of, you know, being a member of a democratic society, and Nico laid out all the reasons why that's so critical. But beyond that, I think just, I think finding fact-based, accurate news that, you know, isn't just gonna be an affirmation of how you view the world, but really maybe challenge you sometimes. And um, we definitely get criticism across the spectrum on, you know, the choice of guests. Um, and I think that, I think that we are in danger of being a society where we all just hear kind of what we want to hear through our social media or our choices for television news. And so I would challenge everyone to like find diverse news sources and, and if you are able, support them. And even if you can't support them financially, I mean, subscribe to a newsletter, um, follow them, share the stories. Those are all ways you can support the news that's being done by, by outlets that you really trust and, and believe are doing a good job. Uh, I'm going to, as the pseudo-academic in the room, I'm going to offer two specific uh, research-driven things. Uh, the first is do, don't, don't go for bundles. I'm about to publish a paper basically making the case that 
bundles don't work. You're much better off for publishers. You're much better off being a member for KPPC and the Texas Tribune and three to five other uh, journalism institutions you believe in. You just, you, you need to, it's, it's, it's a good use of your money and it's tax deductible. Uh, so avoid avoid bundles because the publishers get screwed in bundle in bundles is my view, uh, data driven view. And the second thing I would say is that um, in addition, you know, we've talked a lot about in this panel about local news, which is certainly the passion of uh, everyone on this stage. But in addition to local news, we have a two year study wrapping up at what's called single subject news. Uh, news, nonprofit news organizations. So, for example, the Marshall Project only looks at criminal justice. The Trace only looks at gun violence. They're not, they don't do local news stories. They go around the country. But they, they, uh, uh, Syria Deeply looks at Syria. They, they, they look at a single subject and they go very deep. And it's a, it's a very different model for news. And I think it's a very interesting insight. Climate news is the, one of the climate examples uh, of this. And so I just thought I'd put it out there that a different model other than the local news model is the single subject. Uh, uh, single subject. Hey, um, so now we're going to open it up for audience questions. Um, we have, I will not choose who's <laughs> going to ask your question, but if you raise your hand, um, the ushers will bring you a microphone to ask your question. Um, I have two Debbie Downer questions for you guys, <laughs> short ones. Uh, the first is Sinclair Broadcasting Group. How concerned should we be about this right-wing uh, corporation that's buying up local news around the country, as far as I understand it? And secondly, about um, deep fakes and what the Pelosi video where she was mm -hmm. shown drunk. Um, do you think, how do we approach that going forward? Do we regulate it? Does the government have any role whatsoever in dealing with that? So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the Sinclair. Um, you know, uh, most Americans, most news, most news in the United States, 80 plus percent, is produced in newspaper newsrooms. Most of the journalists employed in the United States are employed by newspapers. The way most Americans get their news is television. And so you'll hear, uh, as reported in the Boston Globe, as reported in the LA Times. They're like the original aggregators. Yes, <laughs> television stations. And uh, while Sinclair is, uh, while Sinclair is, uh, definitely trying to aggregate stations and bring a much more conservative slant to local TV news. You know, the research is pretty clear that local TV news for, for a couple decades has been pretty problematic on fundamental issues. For example, um, most, uh, it's pretty well documented in pretty much every, ma every major news market in the United States the volume of local news coverage about crimes committed by men of color is totally out of proportion to the, to the actual crime in the city and who commits it. Leading me to once referred to local television news as a racism delivery vehicle in the United States. So I guess my feeling is that well before Sinclair came along, this is actually kind of a central problem. Uh, some of it is not necessarily about, uh, some of it does not start with race, it start with the old news adage, if it bleeds, it leads, and then they layer some racism on top of it. So I think there's, um, th that's, my, that's my feeling about Sinclair. How serious of an issue? Local television news is a serious problem. And does Sinclair make it a little bit worse? Yeah, but please, we got a bigger issue here. On the, on the misinformation front, uh, you know, we also have, a, have had a big project looking at misinformation on social media uh, over the last two years. And, um, you know, when I opened and I described the collapse of local news in the United States, that's created a giant void in our information diets. And, um, and basically a bunch of crap has been poured into it. And the, 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 the nonprofit news on this stage, they're like the front lines and beating back misinformation on social networks. It's really, 
the, the organizations like KPPC, KPCC and the Texas Tribune are it's our t- best. The call letters are terrible. You're not What's that? Thing. The call letters are terrible. They're it's really not hard just to say. me. KPCC. The, 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 that is the best and most reliable way to defeat misinformation is to make sure there is a large and sustainable supply of quality information. Um, and, because right now we don't have it. Right now, especially on social media, there's just not really very much good stuff. And there's a vast ocean of terrifying, terrible stuff. And so could we get Facebook or YouTube to like do a better job straining out the crap? Yes. Uh, but ultimately, if they strain out the crap and there is no news, then what's left? Photos of my cousin's dogs. I mean, I would take it one step further. I think we've done a a poor job on news literacy. And so I think we've done a poor job of explaining the news gathering process, explaining what it takes to get a story. That Famously, when I was still at the LA Times, there was a a higher up in the Tribune company at one point who literally did not understand that when the date line on the story said Baghdad, that meant that we had reporters in Baghdad. (laughs) So... I'm, but I mean, I think it's a real issue. I don't. I don't think we've done a good enough job. And for many years, we didn't want to talk about our process at all. Like that was the behind the scenes. You know, you didn't. You didn't explain what it took to get like that one nut graph of information. And I think that that has left people with, you know, out the knowledge of what it actually takes to get a story. And I think that that also, I think we. I've done it myself. Like you react to something so quickly, you don't take the time to vet it and say, well, is that is that true? Where did that come from? Is it an echo chamber? Is it verified? And so I think that without news literacy, you see things like the Pelosi video. I don't know if I, I um, actually tweeted out the Anderson Cooper interview with the woman, I can't remember her name right now, Kristen Bickett or something. And she was basically saying, oh, it's information. And he's like, but it's not information. It's, it's, it's not true. Monica Bickett. Yeah. So, so her claim was, oh, it's our job to let the information be out there. And, and he was challenging her and saying, but it's bad information. It's the Facebook executive. I mean, I think there's a challenge for the digital media companies here, which is they have long maintained that they are not media companies, they're technology companies. And so they have no, what happens on the platform is not, you know, what happens there is not our problem. We just provide technology. It's up to you what you do with it. And um, part of that is, uh, there's a bunch of interesting debates, I can go on forever about this, but part of that's a liability question in terms of legal, part of that's a business model question, could they afford to do this otherwise? You know, I think there's a bunch of interesting issues to be explored there, period. And, oh, we have some more questions over, oh, in the back. Hi, Um, so I I think you're just touching on what my question was about, where the decline of the fourth estate or at least during the time that I was growing up, I was a journalism undergrad and the impeachment and the Pentagon Papers, there was this great respect and in fact the journalists were rock stars and people understood why the fourth estate was essential. And to your point, Nico, you know, when everyone's consuming their news stories through a Facebook feed, they, and especially in a certain generation, they don't understand the importance of maybe the news that is coming through the mainstream, right? The Washington Post and the New York Times. So how do you deal with this disregard by a certain portion of the, gen- of, of the population when there is this sense of fake news, right? That's my concern. That's what kind of keeps me up at night is that people are being misinformed and don't have a respect. If you could address that. I would ask Emily and Megan, do you feel like your audiences take you less seriously? Do you feel like you're having a harder time getting traction? It's interesting because for us, the live events have really been an antidote for this. When we go, initially when we do audience surveys, we hear the same thing, which is, oh, it's, you know, you guys are, it's all just like a liberal rag, right? You know, it's all fake news, fake news. And then when you go out into the community and when you interact with people and they see you face to face and the journalists are meeting them and talking about the work that they're doing, the whole tenor of the conversation shifts and suddenly these people across the political spectrum really become like loyal evangelists for the work that we're doing and share with their friends and bring their friends to our events and then start commenting on our stories. We've actually had this f- remarkable phenomenon where we opened a um, a private Facebook group to members. So like, you know, Facebook, whatever, the devil, we're using them to our advantage now, right? We decided we were going to try to create an uh, environment for civil dialogue where they could share real news, you know, about Texas politics. We've got, I think, upwards now of 6,000 members in this private Facebook 
Facebook group who are having remarkable, remarkably civil conversations. Many of these are people who attend our events in the regions where we do them. So, I mean, it's an uphill climb, right? We're constantly fighting that battle. We found it really has to happen one, on, you know, one to one. Yeah, I'm gonna agree with Emily on that. And I think like when people, like I said before, like if you if you like explain your process, they they have respect for you that they might not have otherwise had. But that's hard, right? I mean, are you really gonna go to every single person out there in the community and talk to them one on one? So I think we do have to think about like how do we how do we scale that? Um, I think you know this reflex of anything you don't like being called fake news is is obviously troubling. Because um, there actually is fake news. It, it happened during the last election. <laughs> the Russians. Uh, it happens wrote daily. It, so. Yeah, but I mean, no, exactly. I mean, there, there's a lot of that, you know. And I think that 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 gets back to like, you know, how do we, in addition to providing news and information, do a better job of providing people with the skills they need to determine the validity of the information that they're getting? I, I mean, I have to, again, not to be the academic, but I have to contextualize the challenge of news and trust. In, in, in kind of broader trends in American culture. Um, you know, more or less since 1980, you know, up, until, up until Watergate, Americans generally trusted their leaders. They trusted their elected officials, their members of Congress, their president, their judges. Uh, they trusted their journalists. They, Americans trusted the institutions of the United States and the people in them until late 70s, early 80s, and you begin to see that trust erode. And actually, in the late 70s, early 80s, what, who did Americans not trust? They did not trust our military leaders. And now, the only thing, the only people Americans uniformly trust are our military leaders. And we don't really trust anybody else. Now, uh, the, there's a big debate in the academy about why has trust declined so dramatically. You know, I'm kind of uh, on the Bob Putnam side. Bob Putnam wrote a book uh, called Bowling Alone. And to take a beautiful and incredible act of research and intellectual uh, intensity and boil it down to a dozen words, he... Uh, you know, in 1950 and in 1990, the same number of Americans bowled. But in 1950, Americans bowl in bowling leagues. And in 1990, they bowl alone. And he says, more or less, that Americans uh, go from having been participating in communities, the Elks Lodge and the bowling league and the church and the synagogue and the school committee, and Americans participate in their communities but then we start buying televisions and air conditioners and we stop building front porches and we stop being parts of groups and, it, uh, and we stop trusting our, our institutions and we, we, get, we get further distanced from each other. And it's in that context that we can think about the decline in the trust in news. And so I, I don't think about fake, quote-unquote fake news, I don't think about that as about the media. That's about a much larger and more disturbing trend that's about the erosion of like our communities and what fundamentally makes us Americans. Oh, go ahead. Is this, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to go back to the tech platforms or publishers for a moment. Um, you know, we've obviously seen massive layoffs from you know, legacy organizations like the Denver Post or the Cleveland Plain Dealer to like BuzzFeed, Vice, et cetera. Um, and, and one reason behind that that a lot of people have given is right, like the ad share that Google takes, for instance. Um, I'm wondering like if you see an appetite for like regulating that ad share and if that's a good idea um, or if you could just speak to that. I mean, the, the Wall Street Journal at one point proposed that and couldn't get anyone else to sign up for it. They basically said, like, we're giving, we're, we're, we are doing the, our industry. And at the time, I think, I mean, 2020 is always so much easier, right, you know, to see that what, what actually happened. I'm not sure. Do you think it would have worked, Nico? Well, uh, so not just Wall Street Journal, but 
Fox and Murdoch in general have been in their earnings calls, they regularly say Facebook should pay us a carriage fee, just like the way Comcast and your local cable provider pays a carriage fee. Facebook is taking our content and monetizing it. But I think this, I think two kind of contradictory things in fine academic style. The, um, on the one hand, the, the collapse, the economic collapse of journalism started long before the internet was a significant force. The, the, there was already some, really what killed journalism was um, roll-ups into publicly traded companies that required quarter over quarter uh, profitability and, 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 inc and, and, and margins that probably weren't gonna be sustainable for the long term. So in some ways, what really killed American newspapers was greed. Uh, and then the internet came along and put the nail in the coffin. So I'm reluctant to exclusively b blame the internet for the collapse of news, because I think actually the bankers are much more a part of the problem. Um, that said, when we look at potential solutions, you know, I I'm, I it's hard to see uh, a regulatory solution that would work in the current political environment. Uh, I think when I look at the future, you know, in New Jersey, the state of New Jersey, the le state legislator has agreed to put $5 million into local public media. Uh, I know there's some discussion here in California about doing the same thing, um, you know, so that, so that media would be funded not just by federal funds and, and members, but also by state funds, because some states are realizing the importance of this. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a trend we're going to see a lot more of. Um, but uh, on the on the digital platform side, it's hard for me to see that. Now, that's a that's a separate issue from antitrust. Are they too big? Yes. Do they have too much power? Yes. But that, in my view, that's a very separate argument from their impact on journalism. Ultimately, ultimately, you know, Google. If you Google something, if you search for what time this event was tonight, and you get a piece of fake news, you'll stop Googling. Google has built into search an incentive towards integrity. Now, Facebook and YouTube don't because they're not, they're, they're more like media entertainment consumption and that complicates it. But if, if you go on YouTube and it's just like a cesspool of Nazis, eventually you're gonna stop going on YouTube, which it very dearly is, incidentally. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you're eventually going to, there's like a risk to the product, ultimately. And so, we'll see. That was incoherent. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm trying to pull together a couple of the different questions and drill a little bit deeper. Um, so, it seems to me that the systemic issues that you're talking about, the business models that are facing journalism, but also the drive for, for eyeballs. I mean... This is like, I, I don't really think I understand how for-profit journalism uh, and non-profit journalism is really separated in terms of the, the systemic pressures on it. So the way that um, it happened in 2016, it wasn't just the Russians. Uh, it was also re you know, repeating everything, every lie or every demagogue thing that got said because it, you know, drove a lot of interest and drove a lot of eyeballs, and that was considered news, but it also forwarded a lot of division. So I, I guess what I'm trying, well, I'm wondering if you can take another cut at, you know, how, how we get away from that, because it seems to me that nonprofits really face this, those very same pressures. Uh, I actually think the pressures we face are quite different, and, and I want to dive deep into that sort of the quest for eyeballs. We don't feel the same pressure, the same quest for eyeballs that the for-profit folks do because our model of funding is so different. They are dependent on advertising and advertising impressions, and they need their traffic to reach a certain level in order to bring enough revenue in. The advertisers basically pay them you know, per click on that particular story. When you aren't dependent on the advertising dollars that are tied to what we CPMs in our industry, when you're really dependent on membership and people who are donating to your organization because they believe in this journalism that has you know, a deep value, 
the, the revenue, the proposition is just totally different. So we aren't chasing eyeballs. Our, a, a skyrocketing traffic is not our priority at all. Our priority is extraordinary, well thought out, meaningful journalism, and to say to people like you, we're providing this work and we need your support. So I actually think I don't feel like we're in the race for eyeballs, and it's part of the reason I don't work at an organization that does, because that pressure in the for-profit space is really real. I'd just say, too, like we talk specifically about the audience we want and need, and that's loyal and well, local first and loyal, right? So you want local people to say, same, same who's listening to us on the radio, right? We want people, so we do look at what we're writing and how we're talking to people based on trying to get those numbers up, because those people ultimately, if we do a good job, will sustain our journalism. Um, and I also will say, having been in a big newsroom where there was a big emphasis on clicks and page views, um, that you know the reality was like you know honestly I'm gonna be really you know crass, but like if you could we call it party in the back, like if you could if you could clickbait yourself into sustainable commercial journalism, you know I think a lot of places would have done it, but it's not you see that happen even at, at BuzzFeed with their lives. It's not it's not doable. Um, so it's like now you're expending all this energy on stuff that isn't meaningful and you're not actually sustaining the journalism. You know, uh, my great aunt Edna is 101 and a half. And she has gotten the Boston Globe in print every day for longer than, you know, I bet you could add our four <laughs> ages. And <laughs> she's got the Boston Globe longer than that. And she reads one thing, which is the horoscope. She doesn't read anything else. <laughs> she just tears through it to the horoscope. And in the process, in the process, she funds a lot of other journalism. And so I think part of what happened was in the unbundling of news, when you take out the horoscope or whatever it was you bought the paper for, um, that 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 in my mind is a is a much more dangerous incentive than just the eyeballs, because there are conditions under which really exceptional important journalism drives eyeballs actually, and instead it was the unbundling of it so that you couldn't have the cross subsidy that was a problem. And I do agree, like I think with both of uh, b both both Megan and Emily that nonprofit journalism in many ways is much more insulated from the demand for eyeballs and traffic. Um, and that's also, th 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 that, that view of journalism is also, I think, skewed by basically cable television. Mm -hmm. uh, and cable television has a really screwed up incentive model in terms of how it works. And it's not, you know, half of it is advertising and half of it is your monthly cable bill. And that incentivizes a, a kind of obsessiveness um, you know, d it, it depends, but, but between Fox, MSNBC, and CNN, um, less than 1% of the viewers account for almost all of the hours watched. And so they're catering to incredibly small audiences because of the way those audiences are measured in carriage fee contracts. And so, um, so I think I think a nonprofit journalism is actually better insulated from the eyeball problem. Two, I think the eyeball problem is most acute in cable news. In fact, because of the way those contracts are set up and the way they make money. And three, I think the collapse of the bundling cross subsidy is is a bigger issue in in journalism sustainability than just chasing eyeballs. So we have time for one more question. I don't know if someone already has a mic. Oh, back here? Okay. Um, yeah, this question is mostly for the Texas Tribune. Um, and I was wondering if you could expand on what you do to help other stations around um, and, and maybe reflect that as some advice for us here in LA uh, where our neighbors in Orange County or Long Beach are struggling uh, much more maybe than we in LA are. Uh, so. It's been, in the, in the first two years of the Tribune's operation, it was largely informal. It's a lot more formal now. Uh, I spend almost a quarter of my professional time now advising other news organizations on their business models. Uh, and that takes the form of, you know, going to conferences and setting up office hours with different news organizations to traveling the country to a hell of a lot of time on the phone, helping folks establish their nonprofit paths. Um, 
And you know what we preach really when we meet with these folks is like the Texas Tribune's business model works for us in Texas. Texas is a pretty unique animal. That model is not going to work everywhere. But I believe that there's a nonprofit formula that works in all these different places. So it's from my standpoint, it's about finding the diversified revenue stream that works for your community. Maybe you all are more dependent on membership and less dependent on uh, major individual donors. Maybe corporate really works, corporate revenue really works in your community and membership doesn't as much. But so for us, it's about like looking at the specific characteristics of that community and finding the balance that will work. So uh, I'm happy to talk to you afterward or to give you my card and we can, I can help you, so. Well, we have run out of time, um, but if everyone could just give our panelists one more round of applause. And give our moderator a round of applause. Thank you again for joining us, and I hope all of you have a nice evening.